And we're just going to do a light lecture. And I prepared some stuff about um, the gift sampling in MCNC. So we know that Marco Shane Monte Carlo is a general framework for doing things iteratively. And the gift sampler is a special case of that, which, if you recall, that gift sampler means you to find the exact full condition of posterior distribution, right? Like you have to derive it, you have to recognize what it is so you can code the gift sampler. All right, but there are many cases where those uh, full conditional posterior distributions might not be available. And then today we're going to cover two algorithms um, which can be helpful when you don't have recognizable full conditional posterior distribution. Uh, the two algorithms, one of them is Metropolis, the other one is the Metropolis case. Okay, so this is more like, well, just for your own education, you probably want to know what are available um, choices out there. And I would say if, um, for instance, that your project will require you to code your own uh, MCNC, we don't know yet, but if like Jax wouldn't do it for you, then uh, what we're covering now might become handy when you get to that. Okay, so we're gonna look at some examples and, um, um, and then give a summary. So, like I said, not all parameters may have recognizable uh, full conditional posterior distributions. The one that we cover so far, we can find them, right? Like for the normal, for example, if you have a normal assembly model, if you give a normal prior for the mean, and then if you give a, a gamma prior for the precision, you can find the recognizable full conditional posterior distribution. But however, if for the same normal sampling model that you give a normal for mu, but for phi, say, I don't want to work with gamma, like I want to work with uniform, for example. And in that case, um, uniform uh, prior for phi, uh, I don't think you'll be able to recognize um, the full conditional posterior distribution for phi, and then that will become a problem in terms of, well, Gibb sampler cannot be used, because Gibb sampler requires you to, uh, to, do, to be able to recognize what it is. So um, now we just want to cover, well, when parameters do not have full, a full conditional posterior distribution recognized, what can you do? And then uh, you might say, okay, let's use JAX, but then you might be wondering what JAX is doing. Okay, so JAX, obviously, when we tried it before, it is um, all of the cases with the uh, Gibbs sampler, so that means you are able to derive what the full conditional posterior distribution is, but JAX can be uh, implementing many other models which might not have recognizable um, full conditional posterior distribution, so uh, you might be wondering, and JAX actually does many other algorithms, including the metropolis and metropolis instincts that we're going to talk about today. So those are good um, to keep in mind. And the two uh, MCMC techniques today is metropolis and then the metropolis haste. We're going to look at them one by one uh, with uh, context. So the metropolis, a lot of stuff. So um, let me just show you the general framework, and then I'll give you an example um, to see. So suppose the goal, remember, we want to estimate for some parameter theta, okay? It's posterior, theta given y. We want to um, estimate that. So what you can do is you can start an initial guess at theta. So for example, theta 1, that's what you uh, do for the Gibbs sample as well. We start at that value uh, for that iteration. And then at a particular iteration s, you can generate the next uh, draw of theta s plus one in the following manner. So first of all, think about that for theta, you can uh, draw some value, possible values of theta from symmetric distribution. Right now, we're just using capital J to represent what it is. And you see that the way that we're writing it is theta given theta given theta s. So theta s is what we have already, okay, at this iteration. And we're determining whether we should explore a different value of theta or we stay at this value. So that's what this um, uh, metropolis is doing. And notice that in the past, when we we're dealing with Gibbs sampler, we're looking at theta given everything else from the full conditional posterior distribution, okay? Right now, we don't have that because we cannot recognize what it is. But what we can do is you can use what we call like a symmetric distribution. Capture J stands for jump, jumping distribution. So we're trying to generate a value uh, given theta S 
for this theta and then try to evaluate should we jump or not, okay? So this is pretty much, um, you can think of this as we are trying to do it by ourselves even though we don't know what the full conditional posterior distribution is. So let me go through the process and then we can have a discussion here. So the symmetric distribution, we use capital J, theta given theta s. And um, any distribution, as long as symmetric and easy to simulate, you can use them. For example, you can use normal. You can also use uh, what people usually use as well as a uniform centered at the value that you're looking at right now. So the example that I give in uh, equation one here, this is we're generating from a normal distribution that we can get uh, theta from this normal. So pretty much you can write theta star gonna come from this normal distribution. Centered at the current value of theta, so it's theta s, with a standard deviation c. So you see that we don't need the help with any other parameters at all, not even the data. We're just looking at anything that is easy to sample symmetric for this theta. So you can use normal like this, which is symmetric centered at uh, the current value. And then you can also use other things like uniform. For example, you can use the uniform uh, centered at the current value, say minus C and plus C. <coughs> so the C, in this case a constant, uh, in the uniform as well as in normal, you can think of this as a way to control how much further you want to draw this draw. Okay, because it's either normal with constant uh, with that uh, standard deviation c. So if standard deviation is large, then you're making a draw from a wider range. Okay, if it's smaller, it's kind of coming from a small range. Uniform as well, because uniform we know that if it's the uniform centered at theta s. So this is theta s minus c, this is theta s plus c. So if your c is large, you're drawing from a wider range. Okay, if it's c is small, you're drawing from a smaller range. Okay, so this c is something you can play with later. Okay, but for now, um, just think about, well, we're trying to draw a plausible value of theta from some symmetric distribution. The symmetric distribution can be a normal, can be a uniform. Those are the typically used ones. Right, so we draw one. So now we have two values, theta star that we just drew, okay? And theta s is the draw um, from the current um, iteration of theta. Okay? So our goal next in equation two is trying to evaluate which one is more likely. Should I stay at my theta s or should I jump to this new value? Okay? When we say which one is more likely, we're talking about whether it's more likely under the posterior. Okay. So the reason why we're doing that is imagine, like we're trying to explore the parameter space of this parameter. We're trying to come to its posterior. We don't know what it is, but we're trying to evaluate should we jump or should we not jump? So imagine now I have two candidate values, theta star, the new one, or theta s, the current one. The way that we evaluate it is looking at a ratio that we write over here, which is what this little r stands for. It's the ratio of the posterior of theta star over the posterior probability at theta s. Okay. So if r is larger, in this case, if r is larger than one, if you look at equation two, the one that I uh, uh, put in the red box now, the ratio of the posterior probability if the ratio R is greater than one, that is saying that theta star is more likely, right? We should choose theta star. So that will be the indication of, well, we should jump to this new theta star. If it's gonna be smaller than one, then we might want to stay at where we are because the newly proposed value actually makes it less likely to observe the data that you have. So that's what this ratio is about. And then in order to come up with this R, as you can see, the ratio is the posterior probability, the ratio of the posterior probability. And remember, posterior is proportional to the product, the likelihood, and the prior, right? So that's why in the end, what you do is the second box here, 
that we can evaluate the likelihood under the theta star value that we have, which is the likelihood function, multiplies with the prior at this theta star. And then we take that over the likelihood of all of the y given theta s times the prior probability at theta s. Yes? Oh, is there a reason why we choose um, theta asterisk when it's less likely? Because we usually want to choose something that maximizes likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Great. So that's why, like, say, we care about the value of r, right? So if r is larger than 1, you will jump, right? So you will choose r, um, I would say, let, let me just say theta star in this case, that uh, it is more likely when r is greater than 1, if you look at this ratio. And then you're going to go to that value. If it's smaller than one or equal to one, then you might stay. So regardless, we're trying to choose the value of theta, either it's the newly drew theta star or the current value theta s, given the current evaluation. That we have. Okay. Yes. So that's the rationale in the first box here. And the second box here is for the actual computation. So what you do is you decide you're going to stay or not, and you repeat the entire process, step two here, for a large number of times, say a thousand times, ten thousand times, all that, until the MCMC converge. So that's the general um, approach. And um, so just think about like now I propose a new value for theta given my current value. Okay, I want to evaluate whether my current value or the newly drawn value, which one compares this to, which one is, maximizes my posterior likelihood, a posterior distribution probability, right? So whichever is larger, we're gonna go for that one. So that's the gist of this metropolis algorithm. Okay, all right, so let's see how, uh, what exactly you can do. Um, the jumping distribution, we call it as the proposal or jumping distribution, we use capital J here. And as you can see, it's always conditioning on the current value of your theta s. Okay. This is, at this current value, I want to know if I should use or not. Okay. So that's always a conditional. So it should depend on theta s, but not anything before that. Okay, we want to make sure that our jumping distribution only focuses on the current value and not the previous value of theta in the chain. That's why you see it being conditioned. Only the past iteration, but not every iteration before. And um, we usually always choose asymmetric density. So just now I talked about normal. You can also do a uniform. But the reason of that is because we want to make sure that the jumping process is symmetric. Okay? Because we want, like, think about, like, it's the entire space that we're trying to explore and trying to focus the part of the space, the parameter space that the posterior distribution is converging to. Okay? So you can think of equation three as it is symmetric, so we use normal uniform such that we can jump from our current value to the previous value, just like what we did from the previous value to current value. So that's the reason why we want a symmetric density. Okay. There are a couple of other things uh, down here. Um, this jumping distribution should be that you can get to any value of the parameter space for a theta eventually away from any theta star. So uh, theta s, so this is just saying that uh, this jumping distribution should be flexible enough and um, but typically a normal uniform would do. Okay. And lastly, um, the jumping distribution must be that you don't return periodically to any particular value of theta. Just imagine if you have like a jumping distribution that always gonna go back to a particular value, you're not really exploring the entire space. Okay. So we're, we're loosely defining all of this right now, uh, but they all have um, particular uh, definition in terms of uh, the MCMC um, research area, uh, but for now, we just want to know that um, the jumping distribution can get you to anywhere, and it wouldn't return to your particular value always. 
so you're able to explore the entire space. All right, so that's the feature. And uh, like I said, you can tune the Metropolis algorithm, especially by the variance that we're talking about. So the normal, remember, jumping distribution is centered at its current value with a standard deviation C. The uniform that I wrote earlier is also centered at your current value with a 2C of the width of the uniform that you're drawing from. Okay, So this C is what you can play with. If you want to have a wider range of um, values of theta to be, uh, to, to be chosen from, then you expand your C or increase your C. If you only want a small portion, you will reduce your C. Okay. So I wrote down small proposal steps and uh, large proposal steps. So um, maybe just talk to your neighbor really quick just to brainstorm what do you think the effect of the value of C is uh, going to have when you're doing this proposal and then when you're doing those acceptance. So I wrote down some results here, but can you think of reasons why this is making sense? Okay. What if you have small proposal steps and what if you have large proposal steps? When we say small proposal steps, it's C is small. When we say uh, large proposal steps, we're talking about large. Okay. So I have a question. Yes, of course. Are you How often does C change? Yeah, good question. So in fact, when you start a metropolis algorithm, the C won't change. You determine at the beginning, and then you always use that one. Okay. Yeah, so you don't change in the iteration, but you have to determine beforehand. Sure. But that's something you can tune. Okay. In a sense, that's that, what you mean. yeah, okay. I want to increase it or want to, yeah, but it doesn't change once you start your chain. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, how would like a, how would like the same number come up again? What do you mean by same? Because like mm -hmm. on the last slide, you were like, you can't return to a value that's already been jumped to. I right. That correctly. Yeah. Um, but I guess like, what in what situation would that occur? Hmm, good question. So Ada's question is, well, in what situation you might return to a particular theta periodically? Okay, I'll leave that question to you as well to discuss. And then, so spend, yeah, talk to your neighbors. Mostly, first of all, what do you think the value of C is going to matter? And then, do you think of anything that will be able to return to your value? Also, as you're discussing, maybe try to sketch out, like imagine if you have a small C, what the trace plot will look like. And when you're having a large C, what the trace plot will look like. Just imagine, let's say, um, in practice, you can try different things, but just like try to get an intuition of the effect of C as well. Try to sketch a trace plot that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And don't put it in the variance of the You can select like that. Between the small C and the large C earlier. The larger and the small C. So we're talking about the C in terms of the Yeah, Yeah, right. Any comments? Like if I increase my C, maybe for normal or for the uniform here, then I'm going to have large proposal stack. Do you agree what we um, have on the screen? It's going to quickly move to the posterior mode that gets stuck for long period, since proposed values are usually far away from the mode. Or if I decrease it to have small proposal step, you're going to have high acceptance rate. When we say acceptance, is whether you're going to jump or not. Okay, if you jump, it's an acceptance. So that means you're going to accept, well, you're going to jump very often. But uh, the moves are never very large, so the Markov chain is sticky and highly correlated. Okay. So which one? Uh, this is a question and oh, yeah. answer, I guess, mm -hmm. for the small proposal steps. Mm -hmm. but I was just curious, the reason why it's highly correlated is because the value that we're conditioning on is from the same distribution and is close to each other. Is that why? 
yeah, that's a good point. So we know that the jumping distribution, like the way that we write it, is always theta given theta s, right? Right. So we're saying that if you're going to have a small variance, either the normal or the uniform, in terms of the constant c that you're choosing here. <coughs> and uh, so I guess, first of all, the move's going to be small, that makes sense, right? Because you have a shorter range to choose from. And um, so then the Markov chain, if you're doing the trace plot, you're going to be sticky. So does it make sense to have them highly correlated when they are very close to each other? Yeah. yeah. So why you don't think they might not be highly correlated? Oh, it's, it's not that uh -huh. I don't think it that uh -huh. way. I just wanted to like know if there's something happening behind the scenes that I don't understand. Okay, yeah. So so regardless of what the C is, the jumping distribution is always this, right? So I guess um I guess it's probably just um I guess trying to get the intuition, which I think pretty much everybody has it. In a sense that if I'm proposing very small moves, it's very highly likely for me to accept the move. And then also the um, the draws are so similar to each other, so overall you're going to have a high correlation. Okay? Whereas if you have a large steps, you might get to say like the posterior distribution pretty quickly. But then because you have large jumps, you might jump back to a different space, and then you get stuck a little bit there. Okay. So that's um, about the small proposal steps and large proposal steps. So if you're thinking about like a trace plot, so for example, if I have very small proposal steps, then I might have, okay, let's say if I start from here, I might get things like this, like very little moves. Right? Mm -hmm. But then if I, so this is like small c. The large c. Okay. Uh, you might, okay, maybe start here. And then you might jump. And you might even just stay there for a while. And that's the problem because when you have large c, say this is already like where the posterior should be. And then every time you propose a new value, it's going so far away from it, and they won't get accepted. So it will keep staying at what you have. Okay. So that's another issue, I guess, um, what we mean by get stuck. Okay. It's really hard for it to move away from it. Uh, but we know that the ideal case that we want for a trace plot is once you do the burning, you do the thinning, you want it to have like well explored the space. Okay. But the issue with large C you might just stay there, never move. But for small C, you might just get like very sticky chain along the way. Great. So um, in this question, I actually don't know at the moment what distribution will actually return you periodically to a particular point. But let me go back to think about it, and maybe I'll just make a post on, on Moodle afterwards. Yeah. But anybody has any idea, like what kind of distribution can get you always back to you? A particular value. It's okay. Yeah, we can. Yeah, I will go back and think about it as well. And uh, we can all think about it if you want to make a post on the um, feel free. And um, all right, so pretty much the only thing that you can tune about the Metropolis algorithm, I guess two things, whether you want to choose a normal or a uniform. Normal and uniform, they mean different things, right? Even though they might be the similar range. By uniform, we know that it's saying that it's going to be equally likely between theta s minus c and then theta s plus c, right? Any values between these two are equally likely. But for a normal, center at theta s, uh, let's say if variance as standard deviation c, so this is theta s minus 2c, this is theta s plus 2c. So it's more likely to be close to theta zero, theta star, uh, I'm sorry, theta s, less likely to be far away, 
whereas the uniform is equally likely for the entire school. So you already represent different belief when you're trying to choose different um, jumping distribution. And that's one. Another thing is how large the C should be. So those are the two things that you can tune about. All right, and you might be wondering, okay, um, is there like a rule of thumb? So typically people try to select a C, like the range, that can lead to about 30%. 35% of the uh, acceptance rate. And so for you to tune it, you might just try to run a few short rounds and record the percentage of acceptance and make sure that it's gonna be about 35%. And then later you can um, run it for longer to, to get a bigger, to like a more conversion. So for example, uh, with a normal jumping distribution, you can reset the variance C square or the standard deviation C Try it with a few short runs, so you can get about 35%. And then you can run it for longer. That's what people uh, typically do. And let's look at this example. I just want to show you some of the um, R script that can make it work. So this is what we actually know that a deep sampler can be used. Or I should say, in this case, you don't even need a deep sampler. Because when you have a normal, normal model with a sigma to be known, we know that is conjugate, right? We know that the posterior distribution is in equation six. That's when we covered it, I think, uh, I forgot, two, two chapters ago. That's when we we're looking at uh, modeling the um, mean. So if you know, like, Ligar, the sample size, uh, phi, mu zero, phi zero, those are from the um, priors, then you can actually use multi color simulation directly. Okay, so uh, let's just think in this simple case, if you want to try with Metropolis, it's doable as well. So the way to do it, let's say we want to do a uniform, okay, and we're choosing this J jumping distribution to be uniform, and we're looking at a current value of the unknown parameter mu, okay, it's mu s, and we're trying to determine how to draw this mu star. So that is, we're drawing it from a uniform centered at the current value, minus c plus c. Okay, so that's what we um, did before. So this is step one. And step two is doing this. Okay, so we know that we are looking at this ratio of the posterior probabilities, but then they can be computed from the prior as well as the likelihood. My question for you, discuss with your neighbor. In your mind, how would you compute this R in this context? So we know that it should be the ratio of the likelihood function of Y, even mu star, times the prior at mu star, over the likelihood of Y, even mu S, multiplies with the prior of mu S. So think about in this context, how we can do this and check with your neighbor to see if you can come up with um, a way to sample this. If we know in theory this is what we should do, but in practice, what can we do? Yeah, a quick comment here. Now we have a value of mu s. We have a value. Okay, it's given. And we also just rule from step one this mu star. So we have these two values. My question is how to compute this ratio given equation eight. Okay. Try to think about it. Try to think about the questions. What you need to come up with. Yeah. Also, just remember the sampling distribution. We know is y one, two y n. They are I I D from normal mu sigma. Okay, this is known. And also the prior we know from this setup is mu is normal mu zero and sigma zero, okay? Those will, yeah, you will need those as well when you're thinking about how to uh, calculate this ratio. Let's give you a couple of more minutes. Let me just cover quickly of um, how you should sample this and then I'll address one question just now. Um, so if you look at this equation eight, we know that we need to get the likelihood of all of the y's when mu equals to mu star. Right? Multiply with the probability that your prior value takes mu star. Okay? 
So that's why um, when you go to this part, you will see that in order to do the likelihood, we're actually in R, in fact, you're doing bunch of D norm because we're evaluating the density. Okay, we're evaluating the density of each of the Y at my current value mu star with given sigma. Okay, so that's so the first parenthesis, this one, is dealing with the ratio of the likelihood. Okay, so on the top, you're evaluating at mu star, the bottom. You're evaluating mu s. Okay. So just get used to the thinking here because mu star and mu s, both of them are known. We already sampled them. We're just determining which one we should pick. Okay. And by the setup of equation eight, you know that you should evaluate the density, which is the probability at those points. Okay. And then for the second part here, let me use a different color. The ratio of the prior. As you can see, is pretty much this ratio of the prior distribution of the density evaluated mu star and mu s respectively. And so that's why this mu zero and sigma zero they come from the prior distribution. That's given as well. Okay, but we have to evaluate the density. So when you multiply all of this together, you compute your R. Yeah. So that's in practice how you can do it. But I hope all of you, first of all, get the intuition of why we want to calculate this ratio, and then now how to compute it. So go back to um, Chad and Benjamin's question. They were asking, why don't we just use the prior distribution as the jumping distribution, so we can have a bunch of values of mu, in this case mu star, and then determine what they are. So let me the question so we do have a prior distribution here why don't we just use this prior distribution as the jumping distribution what do you think you can pause for a couple of minutes question is we do have a prior why do why don't we use the prior as the jumping distribution i guess think about what the jumping distribution is trying to do and do you think that the prior is achieving that so the prior in this case is normal mu zero sigma zero. I guess first of all it is symmetric, right? I guess that part is fine. But should we use the um, prior distribution as the jumping distribution or not? Um, it's like kind of just hazarding a guess, but one of the attributes of the jumping distribution was we wanted it to only depend on previous draws mm -hmm. from the jumping distribution itself mm -hmm. because we're trying to just explore the parameter space. So mm -hmm. we wouldn't want it to just depend on like um, our, like val arbitrary values and like the prior. That's just like what we would be conditioning upon as well. Yep. Just like values are selected, so it would really be the parameter space that you'd be exploring by drawing from that. Right, so the prior distribution, like we said, it is a normal and it's symmetric, but it's a given distribution fixed at the mean mu zero and variant or standard deviation zero, uh, sigma zero. The jumping distribution, we want to look at the current distribution, current value of the parameter, and then draw one next to or around it, and then figure out which one we should go to. So, so that's why the prior, which is a given um, distribution, not about the current value of mu s wouldn't do, uh, but if you decide to use instead of, so this example here is using a uniform as the jumping distribution, but you can use a normal distribution as the jumping distribution, but you have to make sure that it's symmetric around the value that you're looking at. Okay, so if you choose the normal distribution with mean mu s, uh, whatever the standard deviation that you have, that would do as well. But uh, you need to make sure that you are choosing a distribution from there you're making a new draw given the current value okay. so i think that will be a short answer to um why we wouldn't use the prior but um we can use like a normal or uniform which is uh depending on the current value of mu. okay yeah so think about why we want to jump in the first place and then why we design a jumping distribution around the current value and then from there, 
how to do the actual computation. So equation eight is what the ratio should be, and then uh, equation nine is how to compute it in R. All right, so, well, lastly, just so you know, if you actually end up doing this for a project, you might notice that, well, if you're taking a bunch of very small probability, taking the product of them, it might get super small, so it might not be stable to compute. So typically, instead of working with the ratio R itself, we work with the log of the ratio. Okay? So you take the logarithm, and it's much easier to work with. And once you take the log of anything, especially here, you have a bunch of products. When you take the log, they become the sum. Okay? So that's why we have the sum over here. So when you have a lot of small values, probability multiplying together, it can be really small and much, might, might not be numerically stable. So you work with log of R. And then equation 10 becomes equation 11 when you take the log. And that's how the computation will do. Okay. So let me just show you um, in R what it looks like. This is the situation that we're doing, the one that we're talking about right now. Okay. And um, we're looking at P and this, um, sorry, looking at mu. And this P stands for proposal. So we propose a value of mu. So we run it, you see here, this uh, run if, it's really tempting to say it's run if, but it's our unif. Okay? So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, taking our uniform run and draw, and we're taking one of them from this distribution. So it's uniform from this range. And then what we do is we're gonna evaluate the log likelihood. Remember the likelihood function, we take the log of it, and then we evaluate it at the current value. So this is, you see, d norm of all of the y. So here the y is a vector. So we include all of the uh, observations together. And then you evaluate it at this proposed mu value, sigma, and we're evaluating at the log. So you set log equal to true. And then this is how you compute the log of r, okay? based on the um, stuff that we talked about. And typically, you can always evaluate the likelihood outside of the mu at the mu value, so you can use it directly. So this whole thing relates to um, the stuff that we just showed earlier in the previous equation. Okay, so just get the sense. I mean, not everybody gonna use this in their project, but I do want to mention that in addition to give sample, there are many other um, algorithms out there that might be useful. So if you encounter a situation like this, this can like this lecture can be a reference point that you can go back to if you need to learn how to do the sample. And um, I also just want to show that this is um, actually two students working on an independent study right now. They're extending their previous project, and in fact, um, so in their project last semester, they used Jets. So Jax can do the work for them. However, right now they're working with a sampling distribution, which is this Q Gaussian distribution. It's pretty much symmetric and bell-shaped, but it's gonna have, um, I would say, like um, thinner tail than the Gaussian distribution. Gaussian, sorry, Gaussian is normal. Yeah. So um, remember, normal distribution, something like this. Okay. So they're thinking that the observation that they're looking at does not strictly follow a normal. What they realize is their observation has thicker, uh, sorry, thinner tail, meaning that it's going to be more peaked, and it's going to have longer but thicker tail, uh, sorry, thinner tail. Okay, so this Q Gaussian distribution can do that for them. So they figure out, okay, this is the likelihood is pretty complicated, and they are giving this complicated, um, I would say, overall um, little bit complicated prior distributions. So all of this. So first of all, remember for the normal case that I just showed you, you need to use this D norm because you have to evaluate the density of the normal. But for this Q Gaussian distribution, I think this DQ Gaussian is not available in R. So I think what the students are doing is they wrote a function, what they call the likelihood, outside of the loop that they're doing. Okay? And then every time they call, like evaluating that likelihood function. Okay? And they actually, for them as well, each of the steps. So remember here, there are three parameters, the Q, 
the mu q and the sigma q, all of them you don't recognize the full conditional posterior distribution. So that's why every time for sampling each of this, I think I have to go to a metropolis step. Okay. So just so you know, like for example, this is what they're doing. And one thing pretty uh, interesting here is that they have to make sure that, so that Q parameter has to be between one and three. Okay, so you have to add those extra steps when you're running your um, metropolis here. Uh, but at the end of the day, they have to evaluate the R and all that, like what we do. Okay, so just so you know, you might find this handy when you get into the detail of your project. If you have to write your own um, MCMC, so you can always come back to this when you when you have troubles. Okay. All right, so that's for Metropolis. And we also have another one. So maybe just quickly cover this and we're gonna end early, hopefully. So um, the motivation here is we um, earlier talking about using symmetric proposal distribution. Uh, sometimes it might not be efficient. For example, it takes too long for the chain to converge. And um, what we are trying to do here is, well, what if you want to use a different type of proposal distribution that can make the chain a little bit more efficient? And the way to do this is what we call the metropolis testing. So the key here is that, well, now we're deviating from the symmetric uh, sampling or jumping distribution. We're trying to do something maybe non-symmetric, um, but we're trying to still leverage the knowledge that we have about the metropolis. So what we're doing is we're gonna propose like a different types of jumping distribution, but then we're gonna correct the acceptance ratio for some fact because we already changed the jumping distribution that we want to do, and that leads to the metropolis tasting. And so let me just show you what it looks like. A little bit complicated than before. Um, so it does not have to be a symmetric distribution anymore. I think the jumping distribution here. And what you do is you're going to compute this metropolis Hastings ratio, which is, I define it to be alpha now. Earlier we had the ratio to be R, right? And now we're looking at um, this alpha. And what we do is you're going to determine, uh, like depends on the value of alpha, you're going to decide whether you're going to stay or you're going to move to a new draw. Okay. So again, uh, this might be um, a little bit challenging to understand, but pretty much we're still trying to compute a ratio that can help us to determine whether we should stay or go to the new draw. Okay. In this case, you see that the ratio that we're looking at is the minimum between one and this thing. Okay. So if you have your notes from before, especially about the metropolis, look at the difference between the ratio here and the ratio earlier. So the R that we had before, remember, is the ratio of the posterior directly, actually. And then we simplify that into y. Even. So it's the product of the prior and the likelihood, and the product of the likelihood and the prior here. Yeah. So look at the difference here. Earlier we were saying that we're trying to correct the ratio for the fact that the jumping distribution is not symmetric anymore. So what do you think alpha, like how is alpha different from R in the way that we're presenting them here? I can check with your neighbor if you want. So one thing you might notice is we put down the ratio in the metropolis and R in this case down here is that we do not have the contribution of the jumping distribution. But of course, when you're looking at the jumping distribution, make sure that on the top is theta s given theta star. Okay. The bottom is theta star given theta s. If we're trying to take into a factor of that. And um, earlier Sarah was saying, well, if you do have the metropolis algorithm, 
which is, well, when the jumping distribution is symmetric, we show that earlier when they're symmetric, these two are equal to each other, right? So when they are symmetric, then this ratio, the J, um, the, the ratio of the two jumping distribution reduces to one. So then this becomes the R that we talked about before. Okay. <coughs> so that's why you can think of this ratio of the jumping distribution as a correction factor to account for the fact that now we're not doing a symmetric jumping. We're making sure that we are um, correcting the ratio uh, because of that. All right, so that's the gist, I would say. And once you have non-symmetric jumping distribution, those two cannot cancel out. So you're going to just add that into your computation. So, well, very similarly, um, still a lot of the features, but make sure that you do not uh, depend on previous values, but only on the current values of theta s. You don't return to a particular value, uh, value uh, periodically. You also try to get about 35% of um, acceptance rate, and you can um, also just use uh, many kinds of jumping distribution in this case because it does not have to be symmetric anymore. All right, so this slide is about, well, the trouble is hasting is the most general sense that we're talking about. So for Metropolis, we just talked about it. When uh, you have symmetric jumping distribution, the Metropolis, uh, sorry, the Metropolis Hastings becomes Metropolis, because you can see that the ratio now just becomes the posterior probabilities, okay, the ratio of that. And the Gibbs sampler that we talked about, which I'm writing over here, can you verify that when you're doing a Gibbs sampler, the jumping distribution equals the target distribution, so your alpha, the rate, or I should say the ratio is always one. Does that make sense to you? Think about what we did in the Gibbs sampler case. And can you see Gibbs sampler as a special case of the metropolis case in this year? Maybe a couple of minutes. Does it make sense? So why the jumping distribution is the same as the target distribution in Gibbs sampler? Do you think they should be the same? What does Gibbs sampler do? Gibbs sampler derives the full conditional posterior distribution, right? You know what it is. Well, maybe normal, maybe gamma, whatever you do. So jumping distribution will be the target, which is the posterior that we have. And then we plug that in into uh, the general ratio. So not on this slide, it's previous, previous slide here. Um, when you have your jumping like this. Okay. So you're going to cancel out the terms. And you're going to go to alpha equals to 1. So that's why in Gibbs sample, we always accept. We don't even talk about accept or not in that situation. Okay. We always just generate 1, and you go to that. Okay. Whereas right now with Metropolis and Metropolis Hastings, we care about exceptions or not. All right, so um, yeah, I think I included the slide and stuff, so you might check it later if you want to use the Metropolis Hastings algorithm for your own project. But again, I don't expect everybody will have to do this in the project. So if you do um, have it, um, make sure that you come back to this slide so you might um, take, take a note. And this is the example that I'm giving here is thinking about the jumping distribution to be a gamma distribution. It's not symmetric. And um, you can do whatever you want. And then the computation of the ratio is similarly done in what we talked about earlier. Okay, you just had now jumping distribution added up together to get the ratio. And um, you also take the log just to make the computation more stable and with some stuff. Okay. So lastly, just quickly, uh, when you have MCMC where you have multiple parameters and you notice that sometimes you might use a GIF, okay, if you can recognize the full conditional. Sometimes if you don't, you can either use a metropolis or a metropolis hastings. Okay. So that means when you run your own MCMC, it depends on what the parameters you're working with. If you're working with a parameter that does have 
for conditional posterior distribution you can use a Gibbs step. Okay, that's just taking it like drawing from it um, Gibbs step. And if you do not recognize the full conditional posterior distribution, you can use a metropolis step or a metropolis hastings. So that's why a lot of times for complicated models, your MCMC will have multiple chunks about different sampling schemes. Okay? You don't have to use Gibbs sampler. I mean, sometimes you just cannot use Gibbs sampler, but you can use some Gibbs steps within MCMC if you can still recognize the um, full conditional distribution. If you don't, you can use other steps like what we talked about here. Okay, but the iterative um, procedure or iterative nature doesn't change. You always do um, what you have, like say for the next iteration, you condition all the previous iterations. And then for Gibbs, we know that you have to immediately use the new draws that you have, right? For the next parameter, when you're drawing uh, MCMC with multiple different steps, either Gibbs or Metropolis or Metropolis Hastings, make sure that once you update one parameter, use it immediately for updating the next parameter, even within the iteration. Okay, we want to make sure that we always use the most updated draws. Yeah, that's all I prepared, so I don't mind if we end um, early, I guess, or tired and looking forward to the break.